Welcome back to Discrete Differential Geometry. Let's keep on talking about discrete curvature. So last time we started with this goal of obtaining a unified picture of many different perspectives on discrete curvature by connecting smooth and discrete pictures. And last time we took an integral approach, meaning we got vector-valued curvature quantities by integrating uh, so-called curvature normals over vertex neighborhoods. We also got different scalar curvature quantities by integrating curvatures of a smooth or mollified surface. And it looked like we kind of had this big jumble of different quantities. We had the scalar mean curvature, the vector mean curvature, and so forth. This time, we're going to take a variational approach where we get curvatures by taking derivatives of the surface. And in particular, we're going to see that these vector quantities and scalar quantities that we saw last time are actually related in a very natural way. That the change in the scalar curvatures gives us these vector curvature normals. Just to recap what we did last time, we said there were sort of three vector quantities we cared about. The normal, the mean curvature normal, and the Gauss curvature normal. And we saw that we could write these down using just the immersion F, describing the shape of the surface, and the Gauss map N, which describes its normals. In particular, we can kind of get the surface normal, or a to form in the direction of the surface normal by wedging together the differential of f with itself, df wedge df. We get the mean curvature normal by doing df wedge dn, and we get the Gauss curvature normal by doing dn wedge dn. When we go over to the discrete side, when we think about a simplicial surface, and we integrate these two forms over the neighborhood of a vertex over the dual cell associated with a vertex, we get some nice discrete expressions. In particular, the area vector at a vertex is obtained by just walking around the neighbors of that vertex and taking the cross product of consecutive positions. The discrete mean curvature normal is obtained via the Cotan formula. So we add up the edge vectors sticking out of the vertex weighted by the sum of the cotangents of the angles opposite each edge. And the discrete Gauss curvature normal looks very similar, except that we replace the cotangent weights with the dihedral angles divided by the edge lengths. Okay, so those were our vector quantities. We also had scalar curvature quantities. In particular, we had the Gaussian curvature at a vertex, which is 2 pi minus the sum of interior angles, theta i, j, k. We had the mean curvature associated with an edge, which we said was 1 half the edge length times the dihedral angle. And then we had two other important quantities, which aren't really curvatures, but play an important role in our story, and that's the triangle area, A, I, J, K, and the volume of a tetrahedron, V, I, J, K. And we saw how we can kind of break up the volume of the whole surface into the volume contributed by every triangle. Pick some point and make a tetrahedron with every triangle. Now, one thing we didn't actually say last time was how to compute the principal curvatures. Right? the maximum and minimum amount of bending in any direction. Well, one way to get our hands on these principal curvatures is to remember one of the definitions of the Gaussian curvature, which is that it can be expressed as the product of principal curvatures, and the definition of the mean curvature, which is, well, it's the mean of the two principal curvatures. So if we know what h and k are, then we can just go ahead and solve these two equations for the two principal curvatures. We can say kappa is equal to the mean curvature plus or minus the square root of mean curvature squared minus Gaussian curvature. Now that works out fine in the smooth setting, but we have a little bit of a problem in the discrete setting, which is so far we've described 
Gaussian curvature as a quantity at vertices and mean curvature as a quantity at edges. So to resolve this, we can define a very similar vertex mean curvature by just saying, let's go ahead and integrate the edge mean curvature over the neighborhood of the vertex. So if C sub I is the dual cell associated with vertex I, we can imagine integrating the mean curvature of our mollified surface over this dual cell. And because this dual cell cuts through the primal edges at their midpoints, we get something that looks just like our edge mean curvatures, but divided by two and summed up over all incident edges. So the mean curvature h sub i at vertex i is one fourth the sum over all edges incident on i of the edge length lij times the dihedral angle phi ij. Now if we want discrete principal curvatures, we can plug our discrete h and our discrete k into the formula above. One thing you notice here is for some reason I've divided each of these quantities by a, by the area of the dual cell, before plugging it into this expression. Why is that true? Why might I need to divide by area in this case? Well, the picture on the right gives a pretty good indication of what's going on. We got this mean curvature quantity h sub i by integrating over the dual cell ci. So what that means is that number h sub i doesn't represent the mean curvature at a point, but it really gives us the total mean curvature over the area ai. Right? So ai is again the, the area of this cell. So in order to plug in our formula, our expression for principal curvatures, we need to normalize by area. We need to convert our two form back into a zero form. Okay? And if we do this, here's what we get. So here's a visualization of all the quantities so far, the scalar quantities that we have on our surface. We have the area, the mean curvature, the Gauss curvature. We can use those three values to evaluate the minimum and maximum curvature. Of course, there's also the volume, which I haven't really depicted here, but you can imagine just the volume of the surface on the left. Okay, I said our goal today is to relate these scalar curvatures to our vector curvatures by taking derivatives. And in order to do this, it's going to be helpful of thinking about or asking what's a good way to take derivatives of geometric quantities? Right? A lot of geometric problems and algorithms involve at some point taking derivatives of functions expressed in terms of elementary geometric quantities, lengths, angles, areas, and so forth. For instance, at some moment we might need to know how does the area of a triangle change as we move one of its vertices around. More generally, when we are evaluating these derivatives for some kind of simulation or optimization, we need to know how does one geometric quantity change with respect to another. And of course, you all have a background in calculus and you know how to take derivatives with respect to scalar variables, but I'm really gonna advocate that when you're thinking about geometric problems, you shouldn't just grind out your derivatives by taking partial derivatives with respect to every variable independently. That's just going to be a lot more work than you really need to do, and it's going to give you a lot less insight about what's going on geometrically with your problem. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to follow a nice geometric recipe. For whatever quantity we're considering, we're going to first ask a question, what direction does the quantity change the quickest? This is the basic idea behind the gradient. It's the direction of steepest ascent. It's the direction in which change is happening 
fastest? Well, often when we're looking at a piece of geometry, answering this first question is something we can do by using geometric reasoning and geometric intuition rather than grinding out partial derivatives. Once we know what the direction of fastest change is, we can then ask, how much is the quantity changing? What is the magnitude of this change if I go in that direction? Right? And together, these two pieces of information, the direction and the magnitude of quickest change, give us the gradient that we're looking for. Okay? And we'll go through a couple examples of this. One thing you might ask is, do I really need to do this? I mean, why not just go ahead and take derivatives in the usual way? And the answer, again, is that it usually takes way more work, and it can lead to expressions that are inefficient, that might be numerically unstable, they might be hard to understand, it's not really clear what the resulting expression means. Okay, so as one simple example, let's just consider the gradient of the angle, theta, between two segments, BA and CA, with respect to the coordinates of point A. So I want to I want to know how should I move A to increase that angle as quickly as possible. And just looking at this picture, you might already have some intuition about which direction A should move, but forget about your intuition. Just go ahead and try to grind it out in terms of partial derivatives. So this is actually an example that I worked out in Mathematica, which will take all these derivatives for me and will do a lot of pretty sophisticated simplification for me. Right? So I wrote down the three points, I wrote down an expression for the angle theta, and then I asked Mathematica to simplify the expression for the gradient. And out comes this whole mess of symbols, even after doing as much simplification as it possibly can. Right? And you can imagine, again, that this is going to be costly to evaluate computationally, there could be places where I'm doing subtractions or divisions that are causing me numerical problems. And I certainly don't have any understanding of what this direction means. What is the direction that the gradient points? I have no idea from looking at this expression. So let's try doing this a different way. Let's try doing a more geometric derivative. So instead of taking partial derivatives, we're going to break the calculation into these two pieces that I mentioned. So the first question is, what direction can we move the point A to most quickly increase the angle theta? And just to be simple here, we'll assume that this figure is in the two-dimensional plane. Okay? So what direction should I move A so that theta gets bigger as quickly as possible? Okay, I claim the answer is it should be orthogonal to the segment AB. So one way I could write this, at least if I just care about the direction, the unit direction, I could write this as B minus A over norm B minus A, so the unit vector pointing from A to B, and then J here denotes a 90 degree rotation in the counterclockwise direction. Okay? I claim that's true, but do you buy it? Why should that be the direction that increases theta as quickly as possible? Okay, the basic reason is that if I consider the only other direction, the complementary direction point, pointing from B to A, well, that's not going to change the angle at all. I'm just going to make that segment longer, or if I go the other way, I make it shorter, but it doesn't change the angle. Right? So we know that this orthogonal direction really must be the direction of quickest increase. What about the magnitude? How much does the angle change if we move in this direction? So, in other words, for a unit amount of motion, right, I move one meter, 
what is the corresponding change in angle? How many radians per meter, if you like? Well, here's the way I like to look at this. So if I imagine that I keep going along this direction, if at every moment I go in the direction orthogonal to the segment, then what I'm actually doing is tracing out a circle around the point B. And I know that going around the whole circle is going to change the angle by 2 pi radians over a total distance of 2 pi r. So the radians per meter is 2 pi over 2 pi r, or 1 over r, or in this case, I can write the radius as just the length of the segment, the norm of b minus a. Okay? So then we can put these two together and say that the gradient, the overall gradient, is found by just multiplying the unit direction by the magnitude. So the gradient of theta with respect to a is equal to j times b minus a over norm b minus a squared. You can go back, if you like, if you don't believe it, you can go back and you can compare it with an expression that you get from partial derivatives. You can numerically evaluate your long indecipherable expression. You can numerically evaluate this much simpler expression. You'll find that the two expressions agree, except obviously this one is much simpler, much shorter, and has a very clear meaning. Let's try another example. Let's consider a triangle in the plane again. And we can ask, what's the gradient of the area of this triangle with respect to one of its vertices, p? OK? So I want to move p in the direction that will increase the area as quickly as possible. What should I do? Well, the key thing to remember here is that area for a triangle can be expressed as one half the base times the height. So if I do a motion of the vertex that doesn't change the height, right? If I move it parallel to the base, it's not going to change the area. And also, I can't change the base length by moving the vertex. I could only ever hope to change the height. Right? The length of the segment opposite p can't be changed by moving p. Okay? So I have this line along which I can move without changing the area, and that means that the direction of quickest increase must be in the orthogonal direction. It must be in the direction perpendicular to the base. Right? Okay, so that gives me the direction, and then I can think about the magnitude. Now, before going on to magnitude, let's go ahead and ask what if this were a triangle in three dimensional space? It still has a well defined area. I can still ask what direction should I move P to increase the area as quickly as possible? What now is the gradient? Did the gradient direction change? Does the gradient have any component out of the plane? Well, there are a couple ways to convince yourself the answer really has to be no. One is simply symmetry. How could it go up out of the plane? How could that be better than going down out of the plane? By symmetry, there's no way one direction could be better than the other. Another way of thinking about it, if you're not convinced by the symmetry argument, is to say, well, moving orthogonal to the plane for just a brief moment of time, it's equivalent to making a little rotation of the triangle. So if I keep moving in the direction orthogonal 
to the triangle, I'm actually going around in a circle. In other words, all I'm doing by moving orthogonal to the current plane is rotating the triangle, and rotations don't change area. Okay, so there's really no, nothing gained by moving P in a direction orthogonal to the plane. The gradient direction is still just the direction in plane that's perpendicular to the base. Okay, so how can we write this gradient vector? Well, again, we know that the area is one half base times height. So if we change the height by a unit amount by going perpendicular to the base, how much is the area changing? It's changing by half the base length. One nice way to write this final expression then is to notice that, okay, the vector E that goes along the base has length equal to the base length. And I can get a vector perpendicular to the base by just taking the cross product with the unit normal. So if I do N cross E, I get a vector perpendicular to the base that has length equal to the base length. I know that that's the direction that I want, and I know that that's the magnitude that I want up to a factor of one half. So the gradient of triangle area with respect to the point P is just one half N cross E. Okay. In general, this way of thinking can lead to some pretty nice expressions. You can go ahead and give it a try, pick your favorite quantity, try to differentiate it with respect to some other quantity, and see if you can come up with these nice, clean geometric formulas. In fact, in the appendix of the course notes, there's a bunch of quantities and expressions for their gradients, and we haven't given you the derivation. So you can see if you can recover these formulas yourself. Now, as you go on to more and more sophisticated algorithms for geometry or for simulation, you often encounter uh, complicated functions that are built up from these little geometric pieces. So functions or energies that are expressed in terms of areas and lengths and angles and so forth. And doing this by hand, taking these derivatives by hand starts to get really overwhelming. And so there are several common strategies for kind of automating this process. One is to, well, don't automate it, just keep working it out by hand and write custom code for your derivatives. And this is good in some sense in that what you get at the end tends to be very fast, it tends to be very accurate, it's often hard to beat in terms of speed and, and accuracy. On the other hand, as you can imagine, it's very time consuming to work out all these derivatives by hand all the time. If you want to then change your function, your formulation a little bit, now you have to go ahead and redo all those derivatives. And it's really easy to make mistakes, either when working out the calculations or when putting those derivatives into your computer. So a more automatic strategy is to use something called numerical differentiation, where the basic idea is to take each input of your function, perturb it by some small amount epsilon, and then measure how much it changed. So take the output of the perturbed function minus the output of the original function divided by epsilon. That gives you a finite difference approximation of the derivative for that parameter. And now you have to repeat this over and over again for every single parameter of your function. Why is this a helpful approach? Well, for one thing, it works directly with any existing code or even code that you don't have access to. Right? So you can just go ahead and differentiate any function that you can call. The downside is it's expensive. I have to evaluate this function many, many times, once for each input. It tends to be pretty inaccurate, and it's hard to pick this parameter epsilon. How big of a perturbation should I make? Because in floating point, if I make the perturbation too small, I actually won't see any change in the function. So this gets really hairy. A different technique that's very popular is something called automatic differentiation. Or if you have exposure to machine learning, you might have heard of this as backpropagation. 
And the way this works is to actually transform your code. So essentially, it takes each little line of your code, which has maybe some simple expressions in it. It knows how to differentiate the expressions in each line, and then it uses the chain rule to combine all of those piecewise derivatives into one overall derivative. The good thing about automatic differentiation is it is pretty accurate. You're really getting the right expression for your derivative. It's almost fast as the expressions that you're doing by hand in closed form could even perhaps be faster in some cases. And you don't have to do any work by hand. So a lot of the errors that you might have made, you can avoid. The downside is, unlike numerical differentiation, it doesn't work with existing code. You have to use special libraries, special data types, and so forth in order to do this kind of differentiation. So it won't work at all in this scenario where you just have a black box. You have a library that you don't have access to. You don't know what the expressions are. Can't use automatic differentiation. Finally, there's symbolic differentiation, which is a similar idea. What's going to happen here is you put in an expression, and it builds up an expression tree, a tree data structure that represents that function. And then a transformation is applied to that tree to give a tree that represents an expression for the derivative. Why is this a good thing? Well, again, it's accurate. It gives you the correct solution. Um, you only have to do this transformation once, right? So you're kind of pre-computing this tree transformation. On the other hand, you again, you have to modify existing code, and it can lead to very large expressions. For somewhat technical reasons, the amount of work done by automatic differentiation tends to be, in many cases, less than the work done by symbolic differentiation, although that's a very broad statement. One drawback to all of these methods is that perhaps except for closed form, doing things yourself by hand, none of them take into account domain-specific knowledge. So none of them will make simplifications based on, for instance, geometric properties of the quantities you're differentiating. Unless you go in and modify your automatic differentiation libraries or your symbolic differentiation libraries. So for instance, if I have three vectors that come from the edges of a triangle and my library, my differentiation library doesn't know about that, then it couldn't possibly know that summing these vectors is going to be equal to zero. And it certainly doesn't know about things like Gauss Bonnet. So if somewhere in my expression I end up with sum of angle defects over the whole surface, it's still going to go ahead and do lots and lots of work to differentiate that quantity, even though you and I know that it's zero. So there are sometimes good reasons to work out certain critical derivatives by hand. OK, so let's get back to our main story, which is understanding the relationship between our scalar and vector curvature quantities. And the main point of view that we're going to work with is that there's a sequence of variations that links together all these quantities. In particular, for a smooth surface expressed as an immersion f of a surface m into r3, we're going to consider four quantities. The volume enclosed by the surface, which we can express using this formula. We'll see that in a moment. The total mean curvature of the surface the surface area, and the total Gaussian curvature of the surface, which by gauss monet we know is just a topological invariant, 2 pi times the Euler characteristic. The question we want to answer is, what motion of the surface changes each of these quantities as quickly as possible? So just as before, we were asking, what motion of, of a vertex changes, let's say, an angle or an area as quickly as possible. What we want to know now is if I'm allowed to take the surface and wiggle it a little bit in any direction I like, which little motion is going to increase these quantities as quickly as possible? 
Remarkably enough, we're going to see that they're all related in an extremely simple way. The gradient of the volume is just going to be the normal times 2, meaning if I want to increase volume as quickly as possible, I should just move every point on the surface a little bit in the normal direction. The gradient of area is twice the mean curvature normal. So if I want to increase area as quickly as possible, I should move in the direction of the normal at speed proportional to the mean curvature h. If I want to increase the total mean curvature as quickly as possible, I should move in the normal direction with speed proportional to Gaussian curvature. And if I want to increase the Gaussian curvature as quickly as possible, well, I'm out of luck because Gauss-Bonnet says it'll never change. No smooth motion of the surface could possibly change the Gaussian curvature. Okay, So we get this chain of quantities where we say differentiating volume gives us area, differentiating area gives us mean curvature, differentiating mean curvature gives us Gaussian curvature, and that's where the story ends. Differentiating Gaussian curvature gives us zero. Let's see how this all works. So first, let's talk about how do we write down the volume enclosed by a smooth surface f of m. How can we write an expression for the volume in terms of the immersion? So here's a really slick way to do this. Just pick any point at all, pick the point p, and we're going to essentially chop up this whole volume into the volume of little infinitesimal pyramids over the surface. Right, so we're going to take little one little piece of the surface at a time, connect it to this point P, compute the volume of that little pyramid, and then add that up or integrate that up over the whole surface. In particular, we know that for a pyramid with base area B and height H, the volume is base times height divided by 3, and that's true no matter what the shape of the base is. It doesn't have to be a square. It could be anything at all. In our particular case, the height of this pyramid can be expressed as the distance from the surface, f, to the point p, projected onto the normal direction. Right? So I say height is f minus p dot n, where f is the location of a point on the surface. The area of the base is just the infinitesimal surface area, dA, around that point. Okay, And so now, to get the volume enclosed by the surface, we just integrate. So we integrate one-third integral over m of f minus p dot n dA, integrate this pyramid volume, and we'll just split this integral up into two pieces. So the integral over the surface of f dot n dA minus the integral over m of the normal, all times one-third. And maybe you remember that by Stokes theorem, we can show that the integral of the normal over a closed surface is just equal to zero, no matter what that surface is. And so our final expression for the enclosed volume is very simple. The volume enclosed by the surface f is the integral over the surface of the position dotted with the normal divided by 3. Importantly, notice that this final expression doesn't depend at all on which point p we chose. And that makes a certain amount of sense. right? No matter where we put p, we're splitting the volume up into these little pyramids. Now one thing that's maybe a little counterintuitive is if I actually put p outside the surface, the same thing's going to happen. And that's because I'm integrating oriented volumes. So I'll always have the right cancellation of positive and negative volumes. You can also do this in the plane for a region in the plane to compute the area. Might be a little easier to get your head around. OK, so that's the volume for a smooth surface. How about the volume for a discrete surface? Right? So we have our simplicial surface. We want to know the enclosed volume. Well, one way to do this is to simply apply the smooth formula. Right? Simply integrate f dot n over the surface, or we can do that by integrating over each triangle and then summing up the result. 
And if you do this, you'll discover that the volume enclosed by a simplicial surface has a very nice simple expression. It's just one sixth, the sum over all triangles in the surface of fi dot fj cross fk, where i, j, and k are the vertices of the triangle. One thing to reflect on here is that this strategy is not something we can always do to go from the smooth to the discrete. We've seen cases in the past where we tried to naively apply a smooth definition to a discrete surface and things fell apart because, for instance, we had too many derivatives and our surface is not differentiable. In this case, everything worked out nicely because all we need is the positions f and the normals n, and we have that at least for every triangle. Okay, But things aren't always so easy. Okay, so now let's go ahead and take the gradient of the volume enclosed by our discrete surface. And because the gradient of volume in the smooth setting gives us just the unit normal direction, just the Gauss map, then this gives us a good reason to interpret this volume gradient as one definition for a vertex normal. In particular, if we take the gradient of the enclosed volume with respect to the position of just one of the vertices, f sub i, that's the same as taking the gradient of this sum over all triangles of fi dot fj cross fk. Now, one thing to think about is which triangles in this sum even matter? Only those triangles that contain vertex i. Okay, and if we take the derivative with respect to vertex i, we just peel off this fi dot term, and we're left with a sum over all triangles touching vertex i of the cross product of the two other vertices in that triangle. Another way of looking at this is we're just saying we walk around the boundary of the vertex star, and we take the cross product of consecutive positions. Ah, but wait a minute, that's exactly the same as our expression for the discrete vector area. That's exactly the same as what we get if we integrate the surface normal over the dual cell. So that's the key observation. The gradient of discrete volume gives exactly the same thing as integrating the normal. The different pieces of our puzzle start to fit together, and we have a discrete analog of the first expression in our sequence of variations. Right? The derivative volume is in the normal direction. The relationship derivative of volume equals normal justifies, again, the use of the area vector as one possible definition for our vertex normals. Remember we said if I just think about this naively, what should be the normal direction at a vertex, it doesn't seem like there's a unique answer. But there are some answers that are at least reasonable because they correspond to things that we know should be true from the smooth setting. Another way to derive the same formula, a little exercise you can do uh, at home, is to write down the volume of a discrete surface just directly as a sum of signed tetrahedron volumes. We already are kind of thinking about it this way. And rather than falling back on the expression that we just saw, think about a subproblem. I have a tetrahedron, and I want to know what is the direction I should move one of the vertices to increase the volume of that tetrahedron as quickly as possible. OK? So then if you add up those gradient vectors for all the tetrahedra that contribute to the enclosed volume, you should get the same expression that we had before. Okay, just a slightly different way of deriving the same result. Let's move on now to the second quantity in our sequence, which is surface area. So the total area of a discrete surface is nothing more than the sum of all the triangle areas. Nothing really complicated to, to think about here. What's the area gradient? Well, remember, we already figured out the gradient of a, the area of a single triangle with respect to the position of one of the vertices. We said it's just you take the normal, the unit normal sticking out of the triangle, you do the cross product with the edge along the base of the triangle, and you divide it by 2. 
Okay. So the gradient of the entire surface area of the whole surface with respect to the position f sub i of vertex i is just going to be the sum of these per triangle gradients. Okay, and so a little exercise that's spelled out in the course notes is to write the sum of all these gradient vectors using the cotangent formula. So you can write the gradient of surface area with respect to the position fi of vertex i as the sum over all edges incident on i of 1 half the sum of the cotangents of the two angles opposite ij, alpha ij and beta ij, times the edge vector, fi minus fj. Okay. Again, we see a connection to something that we saw before, which is that this cotangent formula is the same as the integral of the mean curvature normal over the dual cell. Right? And it's important to stop and, and realize at this moment this is not a superficial connection. On this slide, we started out by talking about area. We took a derivative and we got the cotan formula. In our last lecture, we started out by talking not about area, but by talking about mean curvature. We integrated the mean curvature normal over the dual cell, and we got the cotangent formula. Okay, so there really is something natural about the expressions we're getting. They're not arbitrary. They're not just one of a zillion possibilities. They really do arise in a very organic way. In particular, we now have a analog in the discrete case of the second expression of our sequence, that the variation of area is equal to the mean curvature normal. Okay, let's move on to the third expression in our sequence, which is mean curvature. So remember that according to our Steiner polynomial viewpoint, we know that the total mean curvature of a discrete surface can be expressed as the sum over all edges of the edge length, Lij, times the dihedral angle, Phij. What's going to happen when we differentiate this? Well, to do this, we're going to need a nice little formula called the Schlafly formula, or the Schlafly theorem, if you like. It says that if I have a closed polyhedron in R3 with edge lengths Lij and dihedral angles Phij, then for any motion of the vertices, no matter how I start moving the vertices around, it will be true that the sum of edge lengths times the change in dihedral angles is equal to zero. Right, so if I wiggle the vertices around a little bit, the dihedral angles are also gonna wiggle around a little bit. I add up the original lengths times the change in dihedral angles, that's always equal to zero. So this has a similar flavor to Gauss-Bonnet, this kind of global theorem about our surface. How does this help us with our discrete mean curvature gradient? Well, let's see. So what we, what we wanna know is, what's the gradient of the total mean curvature with respect to the location f sub i of vertex i? Okay, well, we can just bring the gradient into the sum. So the gradient of mean curvature is one half sum over all edges in the mesh of the gradient with respect to fi of lij phij. Now, of course, the only edges we need to think about are edges that touch vertex i, okay? And we can split this up into two terms, just apply the product rule to turn this into the gradient with respect to fi of lij times phij plus lij times the gradient with respect to fij of phij. Well, this second term, sum of edge lengths times change in dihedral angle, is exactly what the Schlafly formula tells us is equal to zero. So we can just eliminate that expression altogether. And then what's left is to figure out what's the derivative of edge length with respect to the location of one of the two endpoints. And so we have an edge between fi and fj, 
and we have the quantity Lij, the length of the edge, what direction should I move Fi so that this edge length increases as quickly as possible? So hopefully this one is a little easier than the examples we saw before. Hopefully it's pretty clear if I have a segment and I want to make it longer, I should just move vertex i in the direction of the segment, away from the opposite vertex. I also know that a unit change, if I move the endpoint a unit distance, the length will change by a unit amount. Right? So the gradient of Lij with respect to Fij is simply the unit vector pointing from Fj to Fi. Okay, and so I can write it this way. Fi minus Fj over Lij is my unit vector. I multiply that by Fij, and I get this formula, sum over all edges of Fij over Lij times Fi minus Fj. Ah! But that's exactly the same expression that we saw when we integrated the Gauss curvature normal over the dual cell associated with the vertex. Again, this is not obvious a priori. Here on this slide, we started out by talking about mean curvature. We took a derivative and we got something that we had previously seen was related to Gaussian curvature. Okay, so we get a discrete version of the third expression in our sequence, which is that the derivative of mean curvature is equal to the Gauss curvature or the Gauss curvature normal. All right, let's now look at Gauss curvature. So the total Gauss curvature of a discrete surface is just the sum of angle defects, 2 pi minus the sum of the interior angles at the vertex. By the way, another picture of this that we haven't seen before but is a really useful mental image is to imagine cutting this vertex open and laying it out in the plane. So here we can really see what the sum of those interior angles looks like. It's the complement of this dark blue wedge. And this dark blue wedge is our angle defect, 2 pi minus the sum of those interior angles. So if this thing closes up, if it perfectly closes up, then we know this thing is flat. We have an angle sum of 2 pi. If, it, if it's open like it is here, we know we have an angle defect or deficit. We have a curved vertex. Right? Okay, and we said the total Gaussian curvature is just going to be the sum over all vertices of this angle defect of 2 pi minus the sum of interior angles. Important theorem was a discrete version of gauss bonnet We know that the sum of all of these angle defects over the whole surface is always just a number, 2 pi chi, which depends only on the number of vertices, edges, and faces in our triangulation. It has nothing to do with the geometry of the surface. For that reason, what is the gradient of total Gauss curvature with respect to the motion of vertex i going to be? It's just going to be zero, right? I can't change the number of elements in my mesh by moving the vertices around. I can't change the integral of Gaussian curvature by changing the geometry of a surface. So this is where our sequence ends. Okay? So let's summarize everything we just said. We want to talk about the relationship between these scalar curvature quantities and vector curvature quantities. In the smooth setting, we have this sequence of relationships. The gradient of the enclosed volume gives us something that is proportional to area. The gradient of the total surface area gives us something that looks like the mean curvature normal. The gradient of the total mean curvature gives us something that looks like the Gauss curvature normal and the gradient of the total Gauss curvature is zero by Gauss-Bonnet. 
we have now the same story in the discrete setting. We had scalar quantities, scalar curvatures, and we had vector quantities, our curvature vectors. If we start with the volume enclosed by a discrete surface and we take the gradient with respect to vertex positions, then we get area vectors. If we start with the area of the surface and take the gradient with respect to vertex positions, we get mean curvature normals as given by the Cotan formula. If we start with the total mean curvature of the surface, as given by Steiner's formula, and we take the gradient with respect to vertex positions, we get a Gauss curvature normal, which looks like the Cotan formula, except we replace the cotangent weights with dihedral angles over edge lengths. And if we take the total Gaussian curvature, the sum of all the angle defects, and take the gradient with respect to vertex positions, then we get zero. Okay, so we have this nice link between scalar and vector quantities. Let's take a step back and look at the whole view of curvature that we've talked about so far. So in the end, all of these pieces fit together really nicely. We had these scalar curvatures that came from smoothing out the polyhedron by mollifying it with a ball and integrating the curvatures of the resulting surface. We have curvature vectors that we got by integrating these basic two forms, df wedge df, df wedge dn, and dn wedge dn over dual cells. We see that the gradient of scalar curvatures gives us the curvature vectors. So these two viewpoints are linked in a very natural way. In finding that connection, we made use of some key theorems, some basic theorems about discrete surfaces, discrete Gauss-Bonnet and Schlafly's polyhedral formula. We also saw in the last lecture that differentiating the Steiner polynomial with respect to the radius of the ball gives us all of our scalar curvatures starting with volume. Right, so if you remember, we have this ball we're mollifying the surface with. If we ask, how does the volume change as we shrink that ball, we see a polynomial involving the area, the mean curvature, and the Gauss curvature. So this perspective on curvature that we have developed for discrete surfaces is nice because it generalizes really well. We can apply the same thinking to n-dimensional manifolds. We can apply the same thinking to piecewise smooth surfaces, so surfaces that are nice and smooth in most places but have creases somewhere. We can apply this thinking to non-planar regions, and so forth. Basically, by considering this hard question of how do we talk about curvature in the discrete setting, we actually get some general tools that can take us a lot further than our classic definitions of curvature. There are other things we can grab for when we don't know what to do. From a computational point of view, they're also very easy to implement. We can plug in some very simple formulas on a triangle mesh and very quickly and easily evaluate curvatures. Okay, so a natural question to ask at this point, given that we've spent all this time talking about and thinking about discrete curvatures is, what can I do with it? What, what is this good for? And one fun thing we can play around with is something called curvature flow. So curvature flow is a tool that is used throughout differential geometry for lots of purposes for understanding surfaces and manifolds. It shows up in physics, in relativity, and so forth. Um, from an applied point of view, we can use curvature flow to process surfaces. So one very common task would be, I have some surface, maybe it has noise in it because it was scanned, or maybe it just has features that I don't like, and I want to smooth out the surface. Or I want to smooth it out to actually model nice looking features for some surface that I'm building. The basic strategy, the basic algorithm for a discrete curvature flow, or at least the most simple algorithm, is to go to every vertex of the mesh, compute some kind of curvature quantity, maybe some curvature vector, move the surface in the normal direction 
with speed proportional to curvature. So just move along this vector. And then repeat. For this new surface, compute that quantity again. Do it over and over again. Okay. Because of the way that we've developed and, and talked about curvature, we can really understand these curvature flows from a variational perspective. So the, the key point of view is that many curvature flows can be viewed as a minimization of some energy. We have some energy, some function E, which assigns a score or a value to any surface F using things like area, volume, mean curvature, and so forth. And then if we want to start with an initial surface and smooth it out, then we can just try to reduce the curvature, move the vertices in a way that brings this score down until we get to the bottom. How does this work? Well, let's consider an energy E, again, that assigns a score, a value, to any immersed surface F. We can reduce the energy by doing gradient descent. Right, we kind of want to wiggle the surface in a way that decreases the energy as qu quickly as possible. That's what we've been talking about all along. Once we know what that direction is, we actually push the surface in that direction, and then we keep doing it. So in the smooth setting, we might say the time derivative of the immersion F is equal to minus the first order variation of energy with respect to F, minus the gradient of energy. In the discrete setting, all we have to do is replace this derivative in time with a difference. So we just take a finite difference. What are the new positions of the vertices minus the old positions divided by some small time step tau? We want to find new positions such that that quantity is equal to the gradient of energy. To really make this explicit, we have to say that this energy is evaluated at some moment in time. Let's say it's evaluated at the current configuration using the current surface. And then finding the new positions is exactly what we said we would do. We start with the current positions, fi superscript k, and we subtract a small time step tau times the gradient of the energy with respect to the current position of vertex i evaluated on the current surface. OK? So let's see how different variations in our sequence give us different kinds of surface flows. And we'll start out with something very simple, normal flow. So here, the energy is just going to be the enclosed volume of our surface. We start out with a surface that has some volume, and we want to push it in a direction that shrinks that volume as quickly as possible. Well, we know from the smooth setting that we should push it in the normal direction at the same speed everywhere. And we know that if we take the discrete volume and take its gradient, we get this area vector. So our discrete normal flow just says, go to each vertex, compute its area vector, push the surface a little bit in that direction. And here's an example of what we get. We take the bunny, and it starts shrinking and crumpling up. Really, the volume shrinks really fast looks a little bit ugly. It actually doesn't look like it helped us smooth out the surface at all. But it is, it is pretty interesting. We could also try running this flow in the opposite direction. We could try inflating the volume. Right? So now the bunny gets kind of puffed up. Right? And these operations actually can be useful for geometric modeling, dilation of surfaces, and so forth. But OK, it doesn't really help us with smoothing. Let's see what else we can do. So let's go to the next function in our sequence, the next energy, which is the area, the surface area, just integrate over the surface its area. We know that in the smooth setting, the variation of area is twice the mean curvature normal. And we know in the discrete setting that we can express the mean curvature normal using the Cotan formula. So a very, very simple mean curvature flow is go to each vertex, apply the Cotan formula to get this mean curvature vector, and push the surface a little bit in that direction. And here's what that looks like, it, it starts to smooth out the surface, but then what you notice is that the flow is, is pretty singular and degenerate. Little corners start to pinch off, and it develops this funny skeleton. If this were in the smooth setting, actually, basically what would happen is the flow ceases to be well-defined. In the discrete setting, we can just keep going because 
Well, numerically, every triangle always has some area. We can always try to take a gradient. And you notice it does what we asked it to do. It really shrunk the area a lot. We end up going down to basically zero area. And people do use this kind of thing actually to, to generate, for instance, skeletons of three-dimensional models or variations of this technique to get kind of shape skeletons. Another thing that mean curvature flow is very useful for is solving plateaus problems. So plateau problem is find a surface of smallest area with given boundary, or what's called a minimal surface. So the perfect uh, analogy here, actually the perfect, perfect thing that this models is soap films. If I take some pieces of wire, here I have two loops of wire and I dip them into soapy water and I pull them out, I'm gonna get some kind of bubble that meets the wire at the boundary, and, and here I get this, this beautiful shape. So I can use mean curvature flow to predict or model the shape of these soap films. So here's two cylinders experiencing mean curvature flow. Now you notice something interesting happened here. On the right, I got a picture that looks like the photograph. I got this kind of catenoid surface. But on the left, I got this sort of degenerate feature again. What, what happened there? Well, in, in some sense, the soap film figured out that the way to minimize the area while having this boundary is not to have a film along the tall sides of the cylinder, but to instead have a disconnected surface consisting of two disks. Right? Both of those are surfaces whose boundary is two circles, but one of them has much smaller surface area. And what would happen physically if you did this, if you separated these two loops of wire is that long thin strand in the middle would just kind of pop. It would just break apart and you get two disjoint disks. Right? And you can keep playing around with this for different surfaces or different boundaries. So here I just take part of a cube and I get a saddle-like surface or I take a box, I cut some holes in it and minimize the surface area and I get this very nice smooth surface. And this is the kind of thing that might be used for geometric modeling, for connecting up different pieces of a surface nicely. Okay, so let's keep going and let's look at Gauss curvature flow. Here our energy is the integral of mean curvature. We know the variation of this energy, the gradient of this energy is the Gauss curvature normal, Kn. And in the discrete setting, we can write the corresponding discrete curvature flow as, well, you go to every vertex you compute the discrete Gauss curvature normal, so dihedral angles divided by edge lengths times edge vectors. You push the surface a little bit in that direction. So what do we expect to happen here? I mean, what, what does it look like to reduce the total mean curvature of a surface? Maybe stop and think about that, given what you know now about mean curvature. What do you think this should look like? Okay, so we know that mean curvature at a point measures the average amount of bending in any direction. So it seems that if I minimize total mean curvature, I should be reducing the average bending in any direction, right? Well, let's see what, let's see what happens here. So here's our bunny again. We run the flow. Oh, God! Right? Not good. So we definitely didn't make the surface smoother. It kind of blew up in a nasty way. Why is that happening? The first impulse is to think, oh, maybe this is just a numerical artifact. Maybe the discretization isn't very good. Things just break down when we work with a triangle mesh rather than a smooth surface. Actually, the real reason is because mean curvature is a signed quantity. So m to minimize mean curvature, we should try to make it as negative as possible. Right, so actually the magnitude of curvature can increase if we're trying to minimize the total mean curvature. So this Gauss curvature flow really doesn't make sense for general surfaces. One place that it does make sense is for convex surfaces. So here's Gauss curvature flow on an icosahedron. And there's a very nice story actually about Gauss curvature flow um, that for convex surfaces, you can think of it in analogy to throwing a stone down a hill. So if you imagine you take a convex stone, you toss it off the top of an extremely tall hill, and it starts rolling and bouncing down the hill. 
whenever it hits a side, a little piece of the stone is going to get chiseled off and it's going to smooth out the surface more and more and more. And it's going to tend to hit places that have sharper corners more often. So this is a very nice perspective described in an article by uh, Ben Andrews um, with a title involving uh, the fate of rolling stones. Okay, so nice things to say about Gauss curvature. Unfortunately, it's not a useful flow for surface smoothing. So what do we do? We, we're kind of done with our sequence. We can't go on to the next one, right? If we try to minimize Gauss curvature, we're just going to get zero. Well, there's plenty of other curvature energies, curvature functionals that we can look at to smooth out a surface. And one that is really nice and kind of the first one that really works is the Wilmore energy, which is the integral not of mean curvature, but of mean curvature squared. So here we're really going to penalize any bending at all, whether it's positive or negative. The nice thing is we can actually already write down a, a good version of discrete Wilmore energy using our mean curvature vector. Right? We have this mean curvature vector that's given by the Cotan formula. And to get a discrete Wilmore energy, I'm just going to take the norm squared of that vector and divide by the area of the dual cell. Why, by the way, am I dividing by area, and why am I doing it only once? That's a good thing to think about. Well, again, the mean curvature normal is really the integral of mean curvature over a vertex neighborhood. So if I want to integrate mean curvature squared over the whole surface, then I kind of have a factor of area squared in that norm squared term. I have to cancel one of them out to do an integral with respect to surface area. Okay. If I now apply this flow, I'm not going to write down explicitly the expression for the gradient. It gets a little complicated. But if I now write down this flow, in the discrete setting and see what it does to my surface. Aha, finally it does what I imagined. It takes the surface, it smooths out all the small details, it leaves the rough shape. If I kept running this long enough, maybe it would turn into a, a round sphere, right? It'd be like a blob of water that's becoming a, a spherical droplet under surface tension. In fact, this Wilmore energy does model pretty accurately a lot of physical phenomena like membrane energy of a cell, a bilipid membrane. It can also be used as a bending force for things like water droplets or for things like flat elastic plates. Okay, so these curvatures, as we discussed at the very beginning of our lecture on, on curvature, really play an important role in the natural world. And that's why we wanted to talk about how to discretize them, how to minimize them, and so forth. If you want to read more about kind of algorithms and applications for curvature flow, here's just a random sampling of a bunch of interesting papers that touch actually on a lot of the things we talked about. For instance, mean curvature becoming singular and how do you deal with that? Or how do you use the mean curvature normal to define Wilmore energy? Or how do you come up with a version of Wilmore energy that better captures some of the structures that we see in the discrete setting? All right, that's it for now. Talk to you next time.